Welcome to Rocket Space. We're the home of the best startups in the Bay Area. We have about 150 startups here, and we've had about 17 unicorns come out of Rocket Space over the years. Uh, startups like Uber and Spotify, Zappos, Practice Fusion, Weebly, and many others. And as you can see, we host a ton of great events. So let's dive right into this. Uh, tonight we have Lynn Perkins, who's CEO and founder of Urban Sitter. I'm a major user of that since I have two young daughters, and I know she's a major user as well. Um, Lynn has also been in multiple startups and was also heading hotel development at Joie de Vivre. So this talk will be really about the need for speed fueling growth for your startup. So I'll let Lynn jump right in. Thanks Great. for coming. Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Well, I'm really excited to have everyone here, and it's a topic that I think is, is very interesting. Um, and I'm also a big user of both of the services um, that Brian and Rob work for, and we'll talk a little bit about them. So Brian Hahn, who's in the red here, is the head of user acquisition at Hotel Tonight. And, and he leads the growth team, and they oversee new user acquisition, search, re-engagement, social, and partnerships for the in-app and mobile web platforms. Um, Brian was previously at Kiwi, which was a Sequoia-backed mobile gaming studio where he also led growth there. And I thought it would be fun just to tell you my experience with each of their products. So I've used Hotel Tonight in at least three or four different cities. And when friends ask me, like, oh, are you really willing to book something that last minute? And I think, I'm a mom of three. If I'm willing to try this, anyone can try this. So, um, and I'm a planner. So I absolutely love the service. And I'm a big fan, especially having a background in the hotel space. I think it's great. And then Rob Willie is with me. And he's the VP of marketing at TaskRabbit. Um, previously, he was the general manager of digital and e-commerce for, e um, for method products. You were there for a few years. Mm -hmm. And before that, he has experience with product marketing, brand building, and advertising. Um, and I looked at all of his client range on his LinkedIn, and it ranges from Microsoft working with them to Nike to GM. So experience with a lot of brands that you know. And my TaskRabbit story is a little bit uh, more comical. So I've used TaskRabbit for everything from putting something together in my home to um, picking things up for me. But probably my, my most infamous use of TaskRabbit, a friend and I decided to try out for The Amazing Race. And I heard that in order to get on the show, you had to be in line at 4.45 in the morning. And so over drinks the night before, my friend and I said, well, let's only do this if we can get someone to stand in line for us. And so not only did I have an amazing TaskRabbit stand in line for me, but he actually was sleuthy. And he learned all these tips from other people in line so that when I met him to get my ticket, he said, OK, here's the deal. This is what you need to know. And he gave me all all these tips. And then my friend almost didn't show up. And I liked the TaskRabbit so much. I said, if she doesn't come, you and I should audition because we have a great story. <laughs> so anyhow, I didn't make the show, but he, the TaskRabbit was fantastic. So two services that I'm, I'm very big fan of. Um, one of the things I'd like to do before we start, you also uh, now have a new question on that app. Um, and it's talking about what topics do you really need the most help with. And I want to make sure that we, in the second half, when we open this up to questions and specific topics that we address the things that you're interested in learning tonight so that you can get the most out of this. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and dive right in. And I'm going to start with a question for both of you. And, and Brian, maybe you can answer first. Um, I'd love to know, what have been the key drivers to your organization's impressive growth? I know you've had massive growth. And on that, like, have there been any surprises, either good or bad? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, if you think about maybe going back to 2015, um, in general, Rob and I were just talking about this, is both of our companies see very strong organic growth. Um, it's organics are still a big part of our business, and that just tells us that you know we operate in a space that where we have product market fit, uh, which is really great. But I think a lot of companies tend to just you know kind of ride the organic wave. But what we've been really you know, great at is also supplement that and capture the organics uh, through demand generation. Um, the big things we've actually seen is in you know, probably a pretty big pivot is 2016 is not focusing on growth at any cost, but uh, attaining profitable growth. Um, so at Hotel Tonight, you know, we are, you know, we we are, um, we have a lot of investors, but you know, we're no longer in the red. We're definitely a profitable business now. And so understanding how to acquire new users, retain our existing ones, um, um, in a way that we're not just burning cash every month, I think has been like one of the the biggest, I think, turnarounds in just thinking and then obvious execution. And was that decision something that was? brought on by the board saying, OK, we need to figure out how to make this profitable? Or did it kind of happen organically as you fine-tuned both your user acquisition and your retention? I think uh, you know, definitely there was a shift in just like the, the, the macro like environment. Uh, this was back in you know, Q3 2015. 
Uh, the public markets kind of tanked, and that had uh, some pervasive effects on the private markets. So the fundraising environment was much more difficult. And then there was a general shift on uh, basically growth to unit economics. You know, how much are you paying to acquire each user, and how much are they contributing to, you know, say your one-year LTV or whatever your payback period is. And so I think the the larger environmental context, as well as you know, kind of where we're at with hotel tonight, it was. You know, Silicon Valley people can get pretty crazy with, you know, the fundraising and all the money you have and just kind of shifting focus to, okay, like, shoot, like how much more or how can we be more judicious with our spend and, you know, what are the, the key areas that will drive revenue at, like, a sustainable, profitable manner? Um, it's interesting because we, my company is in the process of fundraising right now and um, about a year ago I would have said that our investors, not that they didn't like our growth, but they were kind of like, oh, you're not growing as quickly as we'd like. But we really put an eye on um, getting to break even much faster yeah. about two years ago. And now it's really coming back. I would say that in addition to top line revenue, like investors are asking about like how quickly are you getting to profitable on these customers. And I think it's really smart. Um, Rob, how about you? What would you say? I know, so I know a couple of Rob's investors. And I will say that over the past 15 months, like I hear great things about your business's growth. And I'd love to know, you know what's kind of fueled that and, and if you've had any surprises, either good or bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I would reiterate much of what Brian said around the focus on unit economics. I think the interesting thing about TaskRabbit is we've only raised $50 million to date. We were founded in 2008. So I think the sustainable sort of business model has been something that's very much kind of part of who we are. That said, in the past 18 months, the shifts in the economy have made us focus much more on retention. I think that's been a place that we additionally started to look and kind of unpack what the unit economics of growth look like, meaning by channel and by user and by cohort, which I think was a little bit more scrutiny than the business probably had put on our numbers historically. But more importantly, we looked at retention as a, a key driver to growth overall. And I think that definitely comes at a much more efficient, at least for us, um, rate than, say, new user acquisition. In addition to that, um, it's much easier for us to cross-market to them on a daily basis. So we can kind of see that growth on a day-by-day -day or month-by-month -month level that um, allows us to learn a lot more what consumers want for our business overall. And so has your role shifted in terms of, are you working now more closely with product or would you, how, how has that changed your day to day? Yeah, it's, it's, it has, I would say it, it hasn't shifted my attention, it's just added to it. Um, because now the focus on retention, which is primarily through, for us, performance marketing, um, primarily email is actually the biggest driver of our business day to day. Um, which means that we needed to build out a better email team, we needed to build out and change CRM tools and like all of those sort of technology and tools and really resources that we had were just incremental things we need to put into the organization beyond the sort of everyday sort of awareness or acquisition driving things that we were doing already. It's interesting, email has also been really successful for us, especially with um, retention and, and also gaining back users that maybe haven't even been with us for you know a couple months or a year. Um, but it's, it's funny that all these new things coming out and yet email still seems to be one of the best ways to um, boost retention. Yeah, yeah. It, it really is effective for us. Great. Um, this is a question for you, Brian. Uh, which user acquisition channels have been the most successful for you? I think especially I'd love to know with your focus on mobile and um, how much emphasis have you put on paid channels and, and if so, which ones? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, we're you know, still in the travel space. So for us, it's definitely just search. Uh, we're mobile only. So you know, we drive a considerable amount of traffic to uh, mobile app install ads as well as our mobile website. Um, you know, for us, you know, in the hotel business, we're, you know, our biggest competitors are Priceline and Expedia, and they own pretty much every single OTA you can think of. They're the Kayaks, the Booking.coms, Trivago, Hotels.com, Hotwire. Like, they own everyone. And so, for us, it's, you know, people searching for, you know, need a last-minute hotel in San Francisco. And, you know, obviously, because we have such a big focus on profitability, you know, we are competing against these companies who have market caps in the, in, very healthy billions. And so we cannot outspend these people, but we can definitely uh, outsmart them. Um, you know, I think for us, because we operate in a limited booking window, you can only book seven days in advance uh, up to five, day, five nights um, at a particular time. It's kind of allowed us to operate in such a way where our supply is cheaper than the traditional OTAs. And so we've learned how to effectively message that. And also, even in such a competitive space as search, uh, we made a lot of leaps and bounds with, you know, basically automating like our bidding, like we've created like internal bid engines to really kind of take the, I would say, the human element out of like day to day. You know, if you're it's Sunday afternoon, you want to watch football, you don't want to be on AdWords all day. So just kind of being mindful of, you know, we're not going to necessarily outbid our competition, but we can, we still have been able to get, you know, 
enough impression share because of the, the space that we're operating in um, to really make search like our biggest and most profitable channel. So with, with search on, and on those, um, the automated uh, pricing, is that something that you're, is it a tool that you've built internally yourselves or are you using a third party for that? All, all internal. I think the That's philosophy great. is definitely all very much internal. Like to make user acquisition work, it's all about arbitrage. Um, and a huge part of that is you just need to have really good data integrity. So we work very closely with our data engineering team. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of fine tuning that needs to be made, but for us it's, we're in the process of basically automating all of our, all, all of our bidding because, um, especially as, you know, say like, you know, now like all the, even all the big brands know about, you know, you gotta advertise on Facebook. And so obviously the arbitrage opportunity there is much smaller than it was say a few years ago uh, when mobile advertising was still very new on that platform, but there's still arbitrage you know, even though it's competitive, um, and that's where these this automation and the focus on like these bidding engines come into play. It's interesting because you're in a similar position to Urban Sitter in that we both have older competitors that have massive amounts of money to spend on, on SEM, and so um, the fact that you can do last minute, and that's actually our unique advantage too, is that we can truly deliver last minute, and yeah. so same thing, when we look to do um, at what we're willing to spend on that last minute, you'd be surprised how many people are actually searching for last minute babysitter, but oh, yeah. it, it exists, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. Rob, I would love to know, is user acquisition more difficult on one side of the marketplace, and how do you divide your resources, and, and do you use market health reports to kind of think about the two sides? Sure. So the way we we look at we manage we do acquisition um, and actually retention on both sides of the marketplace. So we call them taskers, which are the people who actually end up doing all the tasks on the platform. Um, and then we run consumer or client acquisition is what we call it. Um, client is definitely much harder. Um, taskers for us, we look at the way we measure our supply base is um, it's a metric we call churn, which is basically the number of people that come in and go out on a monthly basis within the marketplace. Um, there's a lot of different services out there that have very high churn rates, and you probably see most of them in your Facebook feed on a daily or weekly basis because they need to constantly recruit drivers or delivery people or other things because of um, their perceived either low quality or low wages or just their generally unhappiness with what they're doing. So the nice thing is we don't have that problem. 10% um, of our market churns on a monthly basis, which means 90% doesn't, which is a really good rate for us and a highly efficient way for us to manage the marketplace, which means we actually don't need to invest that much in tasker recruiting. Um, in fact, we actually see as much lift, if not more, when we run successful client campaigns mm -hmm. in with our tasker supply base as we do as if we just target them directly and we don't see any client lift in that at all. So um, we see most of our time and energy and resources best spent in client acquisition. Interesting. We're the same way. We focus much more on the client side. Mm -hmm. And on the sitter side, I don't know if this is true with the taskers, but it's quite viral. Like a, a, a sitter who has a successful experience may tell somebody else who's looking for that kind of work. And so we, in general, we just have a much lower acquisition cost on the sitter side and a much higher retention. Yeah, I think that actually goes for, I mean, you can't sleep on referral, right? Like that is by far and away one of the best, easiest, cheapest acquisition tools we have in the business overall. And I think you actually have a healthy marketplace and you provide a service that has value. If your referrals aren't at least in the double digits, then you very likely aren't doing the right thing, I think. That's, and that's one place that we, in the past year, we've really focused specifically in mobile, is looking at client referrals, understanding what people are sharing, how much we actually need to incentivize them to do so, creating both that on, on taskers and on clients, and then seeing how those things are shared has actually helped us grow organically in a much, much healthier way. What has motivated people to share on either side? Is there anything unique that you didn't think would be the motivator, but something specifically has... Money generally helps yeah. them. Um, so it's actually, it's not so much... The, the interesting thing is it actually doesn't take as much money as you thought. Um, and we have a lot of users that generally are actually trying to accrue the dollars to get the service so they can use it for free. And so it's how many, how many actually referrals do they need is a way that we look at the business. Is it two or five or 10? How many of them are likely to share? So we know exactly generally how many people want to, they want to share with their friends or their sort of their Facebook communities. And we look to actually mirror the dollars so they can actually get a task free within the early sort of times of sharing. And then that further incentivizes them to keep doing it. And how about, I know I've, um, I've, I've actually used the hotel tonight. Um, I've done the referral through the app. Is that successful? And is I that mean, definitely. I think it's, you know, there's just inherent credibility that uh, is premised in the referral program. Um, I think for us, um, as, a, as a corollary to that, is 
you know, I think at the onset, we used um, a lot of credits and coupons to kind of really spur growth and kind of get a lot of traction. Now that we're in this profitable growth stage, we're actually uh, definitely decreasing our reliance on credits and coupons. But the referral program in and of itself is, think about it as like somewhat of a credit and coupon, but the the LTV of those those users are just so much, much higher. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Same with us. Yeah, if we, if we push out um, discounts and coupons, we find that even though the initial um, like uptake on use of those might be equivalent to that on the other side, like if somebody comes in on for a referral code, they're going to be worth twice as much as somebody who comes in. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, it's just interesting how that happens. Um, so I, I think like one of the themes that we've talked about, like how you now are really focused on getting into profitability, which kind of fits in my next topic, which is on limited budget. Um, so both of you, do you have any tricks for maximizing your ROI from paid channels or unpaid channels? I mean, it sounds like you guys are, are working towards that. Anything else that you've done to maximize your return? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the spray and pray model, just, I would not recommend it. Um, you know, especially, you know, we've tried a lot of tests um, doing exchange buy, so you can use uh, DSP, you know, plug into Google AdX. Um, and the real, the great thing about, you know, exchange buys is there's so much scale. There's just Google AdX, you know, or any of the other exchanges are plugged into so many different publishers. You can get billions of impressions. A lot of them will layer on DMP, so they don't have first party data, but you'll get some kind of sense of, you know, what the demographics are, so you can lay on some type of targeting. But I'd say don't be, uh, don't don't just get reeled in by this the sheer scale because it's really tough to make the performance back out. And for us, like we're performance marketers, we have to see an ROI for us to sustain that budget. And so um, I would say, you know, we've definitely shifted our focus on, you know, can we live in a world where we're not advertising on Facebook and Instagram or these big like these big name advertising platforms? And uh, yes, like there there is a world where we can operate like not on like what everyone else is doing. And we're, like, we're comfortable doing that. And then we're comfortable operating places that where competition is even, even greater, but we're not gonna operate or try and get impression share like all over the place. Like we're gonna focus on like, you know, for example, last minute, like specific keyword sets that we know will return like a profitable user. Yeah, we're the same way. Where we look at something and say, okay, this one's converting. Let's actually double down in this one versus. Exactly. And we've, I don't know if you've, either of you have had this experience, but we found on social, whether it's Pinterest or Facebook, you name it, that we kind of, it works for us in waves. Like it gets really expensive and you can kind of come back to it at a point. So we, we don't totally abandon the channel, but um, exactly. it becomes a lesser part of our strategy. Yeah. For example, Q4, you know, if you're not a big brand. Oh, yeah, it's, we're out of it. It's, yeah. Exactly. It's the worst time to buy on Facebook and Instagram. Um, but it doesn't mean, to your point, you don't have to completely abandon the platform by any means. That's so funny because we yeah. cut our spend on um, Facebook. I think it's like October 15th. It just happened. Yeah. We completely stopped until the first of the year for that reason. Yeah. Um, how about you? What would you say? Yeah, seasonality is a big part of our business as well. I mean, we, we try to mirror our spends with our actual key seasons. And I, I'm assuming the hotel business has key seasonality Absolutely. to it, right? And so we do too. Ours is spring and fall. Mm -hmm. So we know... Spring cleaning and back to school essentially are the two big seasons that drive our business on an annual basis. And so what we need to do is align the spend. And then we also have, which neither of you I think do, which is complexity for our business, which is categories. Mm -hmm. So now we have multiple categories which have different sort of keyword strategies and have different seasonality to them. And then we have different geos. So marketplaces are not the easiest business not, no. to manage, um, especially when you have multiple categories and multiple markets with multiple seasons. It starts to get really difficult. And I think that's where I would, add, I would encourage everyone to one, simplify, um, which we've done. So one of the reasons, one of the answers, one, to answer one of your questions is we've actually consolidated our categories and we've really liked to actually try to sharpen our position um, as a key way to drive cheap acquisition. And then once we've done that, we've been able to look at markets and categories and seasons in a way that is a little bit more clear for us um, to then do all the buying strategies to then look at actual sort of the type of users that we want. We've built, we've kind of, we've traditionally unpacked LTV in a way by channel and then by category for us to understand where arbitrage can happen. Um, we have a different competitive set. We have a competitive set that's pretty ant antiquated in terms of their bidding strategies. There's a lot of friction in getting a handyman or house cleaner. Traditionally, those have happened offline. So we don't have the same sort of general market dynamics. That doesn't make it any easier or cheaper. Right. And that also doesn't mean that people are conditioned to go look for it either. Totally. So that's tough too. So yeah. acquisition has a different, that's why we do more above the line stuff than say hotel tonight. We do outdoor. 
And it, how, how do you measure outdoor? I'm curious, because we do some outdoor too. I'd love to know like your thoughts on how you measure success of outdoor. You sound like one of our investors. No, no, I'm sorry. no mine wants, asked me, though, I'm asking, because mine asked me the same yeah, thing, yeah. so I'd love everybody to hear your answer. Know, like, how we I want to borrow your outdoor. answer. Um, I'm going to take some notes. So the one way we do it is it's really specific in terms of time frame. Um, meaning we, we do outdoor in San Francisco on a very specific flight and a very specific window, generally on one or two categories. So at least we limit the noise. Um, our business is still small enough that we can see lift. Mm -hmm. So um, that, and then we can also measure retention. And, and Brian's right, um, our paid users are less valuable than our organic users or our referred users. And so when we look at acquisition, it's expensive. It's more expensive than say referral or organic or just retained users in general. So the short answer is we really try to sort of um, constrain all the noise and then we look at lift in the business in those categories. And the good news is in those markets, we also do outdoor, say, only in San Francisco. We don't do it in the Bay Area. We don't do it over BART. So we can actually see um, density of tasks um, that helps us actually measure lift overall in addition to um, convincing our investors that brand building is important as long as it's somewhat efficient. Yeah, that's funny because my answer is when we take it away, the new users go down. Totally. So uh, that's how Traffic we to the website diminishes. Like we actually see measurable um, impact to the business overall. The challenge is, is you just can't do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a matter of for us if, it's a matter of when. And when is the best time for us to actually drive the business in those seasons? Yeah, we're in, we have the same deal with seasonality. We're, Fall is big for us, as is just before summer, because people are changing their childcare needs, and so we do it in those seasons. And we know that in the markets where we do it, we see lift pretty quickly after mm -hmm. it happens, and so it's a good way to measure it. Um, so this, you kind of have already answered this, but I'd love to know um, the, uh, sort of pray and spray versus go deep. Um, when have you looked at channels? Like, how do you decide when you're in a channel that you're willing to double down in it? How do you decide that the ROI on something? Like, how long do you give it before you decide to abandon it? Uh, for us, like we have very specific time frames. Again, people aren't booking hotels every single day. We're not like a you know a mobile game where you see like a in-app purchase for a dollar. You know, people are spending hundreds of dollars. So I'd say the revenue revenue events itself are pretty few and far between. Um, we look at everything on like a 14-day cohort, and so basically, you know, across both paid and organic channels, uh, we've seen that you know 14 days on average gives us enough of a statistical significance to project out what their kind of one-year LTV is um, and to see if whether it's, if it makes sense for this channel, uh, you know, should they mature, would they actually pay back um, in the time frame that we need them to. It's interesting. You don't have another side of your marketplace the way we do, but you have um, hotel revenue managers. And right. so do you spend any time, whether it's in your department or other departments, sort of selling to them, not, not the initial like, hey, let's get you on the platform, but um, in terms of measuring their happiness with the product and how do you know that you're doing, how, are you, how do you know that you're a preferred channel for them? Um, yeah, I think it's just, uh, a lot of it is just anecdotal. Uh, we hear from our market managers, but we are making a pretty big push to do more hotel specific promotions, um, you know, where like specific hotels provide discounts and things like that. Uh, one of the, I'd say the biggest things for us is we just launched um, our first ever like loyalty program. It's called HD Perks. And that's where, um, you know, the hotels are actually providing, you know, substantial discounts um, to basically entice, you know, repeat uh, booking behavior. And we've seen, uh, incredibly high adoption from the hotel um, from the hotel side, and so there's a lot of things that we layer on in the product that you don't necessarily see, um, which basically allows you know hotels it entices them to you know put in more uh, inventory into our extra net, uh, you know provide more discounts. Um, just if you just see the adoption of you know, how much they're willing to go to you know discount a particular room to to get acquire new users or repeat users, um, I think that in of itself is pretty telling of you know, how much a lot of these even bigger brands have become reliant on hotel tonight. Interesting. And what what percent of your users come to you through mobile versus desktop? Over half of our business is mobile, mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't actually the case 18 months ago. So we've shifted. Um, along with the category sort of realignment or consolidation, we've shifted our business to be almost exclusively mobile. We still have desktop users um, who love to do actually more planning and more scheduling of our business, which is great. We're happy to facilitate that, but moving the business into real time is sort of a position that we think, one, is much more of what the future holds for what on-demand economies will look like, and two, um, we do think it's also a niche or a place where our business can really differentiate versus the other competitors in the space. So mobile is very much um, the emphasis of what we do. Also, 
instead of our, his, he has 14 day cohorts, we have 30. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like every company um, based on retention really has to take a look at usage behavior to de decide what that actual number of days or months really should look like. And then we look at it on a two year basis yeah. on an LTV. So um, there's variance, right? But I think the focus and diligence on LTV versus CAC and sort of looking at it on a cohort by cohort basis is pretty consistent across companies that do this well. Agreed, because we're on this and we do 30 day and then we look at a three year LTV. Yeah. It's the same. Same thing, and I think that discipline it kind of ties into my next question about KPIs and metrics. And I, and I think one of the things I've seen work, and I'd love to get your take on it. I think successful growth and marketing teams really pick a few key KPIs and are prioritizing whether it's top of funnel or retention, and really focusing on one section of the business and like managing to those KPIs. Do you have ones that um, you'd be willing to share that are ones that you're looking at with your team? Yeah, I think uh, I mean one of our main metrics is cost per booking. Um, we don't really care about how many installs we you know we generate. You know, installs don't you know give us any money, um, mm -hmm. and so you know we understand that there's a particular funnel. Uh, in between install, we definitely look at the correlation of number of sessions. Uh, you know, how many app launches you have in a particular time frame, and if that basically provides any indicators on likelihood to book. Uh, it's definitely we back everything out to you know cost per booking, and then on a per channel basis and for some channels like search on um, per ad group or keyword sets you know we can map out what you know particular users one year you know projected net revenue will be based on like the initial like you know what type of uh, hotel do they search for and what type of um, actual hotel did they book and then you can work back in the payback period right exactly. yeah. Um, yeah and so that's we're doing exactly the same we're yeah. cost per task posted mm -hmm. is the way we look at it which is conversion and that's the point of payment essentially that's, that's yeah absolutely right so um, it's a point of, yeah, the task closed, right? right? Um, so that's, we look at that on it basically as, a, as the proxy or the metric that drives our business. We do additionally look at acquisition, but those for us is more of a PR initiative than it is anything else. Mm -hmm. So um, acquisition, the sort of startup playbook, right, is to manage search, social, and PR and do that really, really yeah, well, absolutely. and then do paid advertising or other sorts of media opportunities as you have budget, time, resources to do so. Um, we very much focus on the first parts of that playbook in order to get that right. And then we look at, again, key seasons to do paid media. But PR is very much, acquisition is, is correlated to PR for us, and so that's also one of the KPIs. So one last question before we switch to um, the group questions. Um, I have a bunch here I could keep going, but I'm going to turn it over to the group. But one last question. I think anyone in this room that's thinking about hiring somebody to take on growth for their organization is wondering, like, do you have a magical person on your team who's down there in the basement figuring out all these formulas? Or if you were starting today and you were hiring the first person on your team, what sort of qualities would you look for in that person? Or what would you want, knowing that you probably aren't going to hire the, the VP person out the door and you're going to get somebody who's more of a, a general, well-rounded person? Like, what would you look for and what would you ask in that interview? Uh, I would definitely, you know, want someone a little more technical. Um, I feel like, you know, we can teach you know, the, the ropes, the UA ropes, you know, how to use Facebook, how to use Google AdWords, things like that. But someone who can uh, really ingest a lot of data because that's really where the arbitrage lies. Like you have to be able to ingest the data, really make sense of it, and then based on that understand, should I, should I be bidding like 2.856 on this keyword or is it 2.857? And it might seem trivial and like sig figs, but if you multiply that by the scale that we're currently operating in and the scale that we hope to achieve, then it can honestly make a pretty material difference. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. One, I think growth is a philosophy, um, one that a lot of big companies have yet to really adopt. And so doing so means that you're going to move at speed, you're going to break things, you're going to fail nine out of ten times. Like That is a strategy that companies have to just be able to essentially embrace um, and let the team kind of run the way that they want. And if they do that, then you hire young people that like to run fast and loose and understand exactly kind of what the metrics or the KPIs they need. I think also having young people that can be a little bit sort of dangerous with code mm -hmm. does help. Always. And young agree, people, agree. definitely, Always. I'm old. I couldn't do that when I was 25, but good sort of growth marketers that are young now are really analytical, super quantitative, and actually can code well enough to hack at it mm -hmm. to at least get a signal 
exactly. to bring into somebody else, whether it be engineering or other product people that actually can do it at scale. Yeah, I agree. I would say that the person who's worked out the best in our organization is that young, eager person who came to me and said, I've been looking at these numbers, figured out how to pull up the report themselves out of look, and we're like, this is an area you guys haven't focused on. I think there's opportunity. Yeah. And they're hungry to, to see if it's, they're gonna, they want to prove that hypothesis. Yeah. Or, or, or if they don't, they want to learn something from it really quickly, which I think is great. Um, okay, great. I'm going to turn it over to Sophie. So the first question for you, Lynn, and Rob and Brian is, what did you guys do when you hadn't raised VC to okay, spur question. early growth? And what were some of the early hacks and growth stories? So I can I can share our it's specific to our space, but I I recommend this um, to anyone is that um, the first thing that we did is we went and looked on um, LinkedIn for star babysitters that were out there working for competitor agencies and we just messaged them and said hey we'd love to know what you like and don't like about the business that you're working for we're starting this new business and we took their feedback and literally we got them in to try it and we quickly had like hundreds of sitters and we told the sitters we explained how the social part of our platform worked and that the more friends they got on there the more likely they were to get jobs and that really worked and then the other thing I would say for us, um, and it, this doesn't exist in other spaces necessarily, but I think you can find something equivalent. We got people to join the moms groups, these online forums nationwide in different cities, and just start, when people said, I'm looking for a sitter, they would just start posting about Urban Sitter. I mean, the same thing, I think Nextdoor right now is mm -hmm. a great, there's great opportunity for actually probably for all of our businesses. Um, there's some growth hacking that can be done there because it's still pretty early. Um, and so just finding these groups of people who are likely to be early adopters of your business and, um, and get them to help promote it. And I think having people feel invested that they're helping shape the future of your company, they're more likely to tell their friends about it too. So one of the things we do, this is okay, I'm like just gonna share it all right now, is we um, sometimes we post on these moms groups like, hey, we're, we're gonna give $40 in babysitting credit away um, if you'll come on and give us some advice about how you find sitters in your area. And when we get those moms on the phone, um, they get really excited about it. We say, you know, we could also give you $40 more if you can get your friends to, to join as well. And by letting them provide you with feedback, they all become users, it's just a, little side hack that we still do every once in a while? I'll add to that. Um, I think the biggest driver of growth is quality. Meaning, the, when you deliver a product that for us, a guy or a girl shows up and cleans your house or installs a shelf or assembles some piece of furniture and they do it really well and they're on time and they're sort of tight and they're effective with getting in and out of your house and they feel like it's a trusting experience, like that's shareable. They come back. It's really easy to actually retain them. And for us, that was the place that we started. I wasn't, I wasn't around with TaskRabbit in 2008, so Leah, our founder, probably could speak much easier about this, but that's been an ongoing focus, even at scale, is to make sure that we consistently recruit high-quality taskers to do a good job offline, and that builds just sort of an organic sort of force of nature in the business very early on. And, and I think when you don't do a good job, especially in the early days, you should go above and beyond to compensate for that because you can really turn a negative experience into a positive one depending on how you treat that customer when that happens. And so whether it's on either side of our marketplace when somebody has a negative experience, um, especially in the early days, we would really go above and beyond. And that actually carried more word of mouth value later than just about anything else. So we have a clarifying question from the audience about Rob's statement, I think. Yeah, so just about, um, you're talking about getting more, refer more referrals when there's a quality experience. How do you track that? So uh, we, we put referral in sort of both in the, um, referral is, is basically built into the app in a variety of places, right? And so um, we have a couple of ways to measure quality. Um, one of them is MPS. So we know if basically if you had a good experience and if you're likely to come back based on your MPS, which isn't new, most good businesses have that these days, the second thing is we put then referral after that. And so we can tell through the booking process, you're encouraged to refer your friends and other things. I mean, if you open the app right now, you'll probably see a pop-up for referral before you even start the process. And we're okay actually reducing conversion in that regard to insight referral because we see the trade-off actually be positive for our business. But then we'll actually kind of put breadcrumbs through referral, of referral throughout the process. And then even as you check out, because you need to go back into the app, to close the task, we put it there as well. And oftentimes, if the experience is really positive referral, it quite sort of correlates with um, how much they're sharing. So you're tracking your NPS per user. <laughs> Sorry, you're, so we just track a general NPS. I don't actually look at NPS per user, but you're somehow tracking that per user and tying it into your other analytics? Yeah, I can tell you the NPS score of people who refer. 
And you should, like, at some point, you should be able to break your NPS down by the user experience. So whether it's somebody who went through a certain stage of the process or is back for the second time, and we look at it yeah. in different ways. And, and obviously, you don't need to start that way, but I think it's good to, to get there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just implementing a tool of whatever sort of rating system you want. Um, into, yeah, we can do refer by, we can, I can tell you MPS by category by city by those who refer. Like, you can get really granular with it, but that's generally how we track both the success of the service or the category and the tasker, and then if they're willing to refer and actually how much dollar they're actually willing to share that. Brian, how about you? Any answers to the uh, early days? And yeah, I mean, like Rob, I wasn't there, you know, pre-funding, but I know, uh, so especially anecdotally, for us, it's, People are most excited, and we hear the most word of mouth because of our pricing. Uh, you know, we we have the lowest price in our in our booking window versus all the other OTAs, and kind of categorize as like people can ball out on a budget. Uh, I just heard some people like, oh, I I booked a high roller suite for like $150 in Manhattan, um, and that's imp impossible. But you hear these stories like creep up, like and. As they become more and more common, I think people realize that, oh, hey, maybe this wasn't an outlier. Maybe this actually is like the core of the product. You can get like an amazing hotel room last minute for like cheaper than anywhere you can find on Kayak or Hotels.com or Hotwire or anything like that. So I think that kind of word of mouth um, coupled with just expanding to like uh, expanding out our supply to major markets and having that consistency and like that pricing and basically that aha moment for, for our consumers really helped you know, fuel that initial growth for uh, Sam and the team. It's interesting because all three of our businesses have that aha moment um, in different ways. I think like for the TaskRabbit, it's when you have this task that you're not really looking forward to doing and you find someone else to do it and they, it, you get that answer right away. I think in your case, it's where it's like, oh my gosh, I found something last minute and it's a really great hotel and I'm getting a right. good deal. And ours is when all of a sudden you have this fabulous sitter who says, yes, I'm coming on Saturday night. And that aha moment really carries into that growth piece in the sense that that's what people are going to tweet about or tell their friends about. Right. My biggest hack trick that actually ties into this question, because the question is specific around pre-VC funding is that if you think you're going to need VC funding, one of your growth hacks early on should be to actually get investors or their spouses or their friends to use your product because it sure makes pitching a lot easier when they're familiar with what, you've, what you're doing. Absolutely. And we are getting a lot of great questions in, so thank you. Keep them coming and keep voting too. Our uh, top voted question at the moment is, do you have any suggestions for B2B early sales? We are a two-person company and this is very hard. I can talk about, it was before I was at TaskRabbit, but we had, but we had TaskRabbit for business in 2013. Um, we can, I can speak to how hard it is because we, we don't have it any longer. Um, and so I will say the challenges that I know we faced in that point, which is only going to reinforce, I think, your question, which um, it requires a pretty dedicated and expansive sales team. Um, it requires a different way of a product. Um, if we look at our business product two years ago and even we see some businesses consistently still use us, um, it's a desktop experience, and that is different than our core product, which is mobile. Um, it's scheduled, it's not real time, and so you actually, I think, do one, have to pick a lane, and then two, build an organization to support that, which requires, yes, people and time and money. Um, I don't have a specific, unfortunately, solve for that around the B2B, other than be super dedicated to finding out exactly what that user wants, because it's not always what you think it is. We have a B2B channel that's been really successful for us over the past couple of years. And I think the one thing that our salesperson would tell you is that a lot of it's about the timing because you're selling into an organization that may or may not have the funds to purchase your service at that time. And so um, 